Thanks for the heads up, Lucille. By the way, I'm Brian Lusk. Thanks for joining me today. Glad to have you here. Let's go ahead and get started on the news in Ukraine. I really appreciate the heads up on that as well. But let's go ahead and get started on it. If you get in here and uh, could chime in and let me know that you're here, I'd appreciate it. Also, uh, please also, you know, let me know any questions you might have. We'll see if we can find some answers on the fly for you as we get going. We are going to go ahead and get started with the uh, situation with the Black Sea Fleet. The Ukrainians have put out a nice update on the situation here, kind of telling us what's going on. And I got a few other tidbits that might be interesting for you as well related to the Black Sea Fleet. Hi, Jerry. Glad to have you here. For one thing, it turns out that rather than actually targeting the Yamal and the Azov, they were actually, the Ukrainians were actually ta targeting a reconnaissance ship, the Ivan Kurz, and a large landing ship, the Konstantin Olshenki. This was a, a surprise to me because the only ones that were mentioned initially were the Yamal and the Azov. So that they were actually targeting different ships that didn't even get mentioned, interesting. Now, the situation there is continuing to be, uh, be we're still looking for additional uh, damage assessments. Some of those are starting to come through. In fact, the Ukrainians are reporting that the attack caused more damage than they initially reported. This is from the Institute for the Study of War. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to read. There we go. Uh, they stated that they struck the Black Sea Fleet ship repair plant in Sevastopol, where the Yamal and the, uh, was moored, making a hole in the Yamal's upper deck and forcing the Black Sea Fleet to continuously pump water out of the ship. That would indicate that it didn't just go through the upper deck, but it penetrated clean through the ship and uh, and pen penetrated the hull of the ship, causing that type of leak. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to uh, be pumping it constantly from an upper deck bit of damage. They also stated that the communication center, we talked about that previously, was uh, substantially damaged. That was the um, one of the major targets of the strike and really cut off the communication capabilities for the Black Sea Fleet, both vertically and horizontally. So really a big, important strike there on that one. They mentioned also the Ivan Kurs, and they are verifying the damage to the ship. I think I've got a picture of what of the damage on that in a little bit here. Hi, Ozzy. Glad to have you. Always glad to have you guys here, in fact. Uh, so we've got the Ivan Kurs and the Yamal, and there was also a report that they used a Magura V5 drone to strike the Akula class and Cerna class ships back in November. But this is just kind of getting some of the historical information together. All of this is indicating that Ukraine basically has a not quite carte blanche, but they have a reliable ability to strike Black Sea Fleet targets in Sevastopol. And Russia doesn't have much they can do to stop it at this point in time. They do claim that they used a Neptune missile. This is Ukraine's homegrown uh, anti-ship missile that they've been using lately. They've modified it for ground attack as well. But in this case, it was striking the uh, naval target in the, uh, at Sevastopol itself. There was a little bit more details that were coming out. These assault, This assault ship that was attacked uh, was actually captured by the Russians back in 2014 at the start when they basically took over Crimea. That whole situation was pretty bad for Ukraine. They lost pretty much most of their fleet at that point in time. This is talking about the communication center strike. They do believe it was taken out by scalp or storm shadow missiles. But this really kind of, they've just had a commander change in the Black Sea Fleet. Now that commander has lost a major ability to communicate to his units out in the field. And he's lost some ability to communicate upwards, which means they'll have to move things around and try and find ways to cover this gap. Here's some of the satellite images of the damage. They do mention on both of these, this is the Ivan Kurz before and after, uh, that the, the damage appears to have been mostly in the stern of the ship. And they have, they're showing some impacts on the pier as well that may have happened. You can see kind of the difference between the two on the top and the bottom here. 
this is a this the direct impact on the stern of the ship is likely to have taken out engineering spaces and other vital equipment for the ship stuff that's hard to replace and not something you can just like you know it's not like a, a turret that you can just pull off the top and put a different turret on it's it's built into the ship and so they'd have to do extraordinary measures to rip that part out and try to uh, replace it similarly let me see i think this might be there we go down a bit here great here it is this is also the ship azov where they're showing the damage as well on it let me get this a little bit bigger and once again it appears that it have to have impacted the stern of the ship in this case it looks like they're trying to cover up the damage with some camouflage nets so overall it's clear that the russians don't want the ukrainians to be able to get a good damage assessment on these ships to determine how effective their their uh, missiles were but yeah as ozzy says here the black sea fleet has become more of a liability than an asset for russia at this stage of the game in fact it's gotten so far that some propagandists have proposed taking the ships deliberately sinking them uh and so that their turrets are still visible and using them as coastal protection uh turrets rather than using them as ships others have proposed sinking them around the uh, the supports of the Kerch Strait bridge and the so the russians are actually in a situation where they've got these valuable assets these assets are basically blocked into the black sea because they can't transit through out through the uh through turkey and the bosphorus strait so especially in this time of war so they're required to stay in the black sea which means they're locked in with the biggest predator in the black sea which is ukraine's drones and missiles interesting to see and it means that they've got a huge amount of resources tied up trying to keep their own ships from getting sunk by a nation with no navy let's go ahead and talk about the terror attack that happened in russia the other uh, the other day a little bit here the Institute for the Study of War calls it a notable Russian intelligence and law enforcement failure and says that the current open source evidence does not require any wider or more complicated conspiracy theory, either within or against the Russian state, meaning that on the surface and in the initial levels, it looks like it really was an attack conducted by ISIS against Russia. There's no particular Ukrainian trace to the attack. There's no evidence provided of it. There's no there's no uh, indications that there is any other parties involved. The U.S. doesn't appear to be involved. The Britain doesn't appear to be involved. Ukraine doesn't appear to be involved, at least as of the current information available. Now. I hate to show this image here because it's it's indicating exactly how these terrorists were being treated immediately afterwards. There's reports that the law enforcement officers cut off ears, beat them, electrocuted them, and otherwise tortured them to get information, which of course makes the information suspect because a tortured person will often tell you exactly what you want to hear regardless of its accuracy. But this kind of is the same way Russia's always been. They go into a, they, their military marches into a new area and they torture people and do bad stuff. Some things just don't seem to change. Putin even recognized that radical Islamists carried out the attack, but still said there's a Ukrainian involvement somewhere. And they've gotten increasingly uh, crazy with how they are theorizing Ukraine's involvement in this, all the way from maybe ISIS was trained by Ukrainians, uh, all the way to uh, Ukraine was supposed to accept them into their country, and they were arranging to allow them to get through the border. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. On the other hand, some people are theorizing that even though the U.S. told Russia that there was a pending uh, terrorist attack, even though they they had all the information that was provided by the Western uh, powers that there was an incoming terrorist attack, and Putin even said that he was that was uh, American disinformation, it was Western disinformation that there was any kind of a terrorist attack being planned. 
Well, um, somebody have been taking a more cynical view of it, saying that perhaps Vladimir Putin knew about the attack and decided not to stop it for the purposes of pushing mass mobilization. But that may have been, in fact, stopped by the the uh, the um, ISIS actually claiming credit for the attack and then providing body cam footage. ISIS actually had the body cam footage off of the uh, the attackers and the whole nine yards indicating ISIS was the source of or at least a major participant in the attack. So it's harder to blame on Ukraine when there's ISIS already claiming responsibility. The director of the Federal Security Service stated that it was the U.S., Britain, and Ukraine were behind this attack, and it was obviously all their setup, and that's where the propagandists have been going all day. President Emmanuel Macron said that France has information about Islamic State actually carrying out the attack and told Russia, look, you can't use this. You can't exploit this to uh, to blame it on Ukraine and try and escalate the, the conflict. We know better than that. And Macron's really kind of come out of his shell in this whole situation. I suspect he's gotten some additional intelligence information and he's not liking what he's seeing. There were, of course, uh, problematic parts of this. The European Union has says they will allow for joint cooperation with Russia to counter terrorism, uh, but they said it's difficult to imagine that there will be a basis for cooperation with a country that's engaged in this full-scale aggression against Ukraine. So they hedged their bets a bit, but something to watch out for. The FSB stated that the information from the detainees who are tortured for that information confirms the Ukrainian trace. But this guy, this is the guy who's claiming that there's a Ukrainian trace here. He is highly motivated to pin this on somebody else because he says that the U they received the information on these terrorist attacks. The saying it was too general. And they, but they did respond to it, and they did took appropriate measures. But this was a follow-on attack, not the the one that was reported. So therefore, it's not act doesn't actually count. It's not my fault, he says. Of course, the situation is made even weirder by the president of of Belarus getting in the middle of it. Lukashenko said the terrorists planned to escape to Belarus after the terrorist attack in Crocus, but. That's because they saw them coming towards towards Belarus, and they decided to try and make it through the border instead. So, as he says, why did I say this? Because these fugitives, fugitives, uh, theirs and ours, began to reproach Putin. Putin, here he is. Something happened, but he is silent, doesn't speak, doesn't address himself, and so on. Yes, we didn't sleep with Putin for a day. What do they know about it? There was constant interaction. When it was necessary to speak, he came out and spoke. Meaning he's trying to cover, both cover for, and to a certain extent, he's stepping on the toes of Putin. Because Vladimir Putin would like to be able to pin this entirely on Ukraine, not have any other potential source. But why were they running to Belarus? That's a silly place to run to at best. Uh, because it's basically, as somebody else said, it's Russia light. But now let's go ahead and delve briefly into some of the conspiracy theories that have popped up around this thing. Initially, you can see on this picture here that there is a dog and a man in uniform, and they thought that might be an FSB officer. However, somebody else pointed out that the actual FSB officers over here, this dog turned to so the dog and his uh, his owner here turned out to be security guards. And he's later seen evacuating the building with civilians not getting in the middle of it. He was apparently unarmed security, not uh, intended to encounter terrorists in this regard. But this guy's a uniform cop, and he's seen nowhere else in the video, even though this is just 12 minutes before the attack. Others have been going through all of the footage, looking at what they can see, and they found several people who are similarly dressed. And they're theorizing that those were agents and the clothing was supposed to be a, a coordination factor to determine who was on their side. 
this uh, new source is theorizing that they were actually FSB agents. I have no proof of that, but uh, and I just want to kind of point that out straight up. This is go delving into theoretical territory. They have found something that does not have an easy explanation, and they're watching out for this. They mentioned that the clothing is all similar uh, to help them blend in with the crowd, but also quite notable in that if you were looking for it. And these men were calm and not running around like a panicked civilian would. So it's it's really in, an indication that there may have been some additional um, people involved in this, either authority or perhaps a, not an authority. We don't know. Of course, there's somebody else who pointed out that they lit the Crocus Music Hall on fire, and within an hour, the the roof had collapsed. They were still in the middle of trying to recover remains. I th as I understand it, that is mostly over at this point. Um, the idea being to identify the people that were that were perished in the fire, but this building collapsing so fast seems pretty insane. And some people have said that the that the person involved had actually disabled the 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 fire system and all that kind of stuff. But even so, a fire that goes that fast would indicate some real knowledge of how to carry out that type of attack and deliberately target that building in that way. Uh, our journalist Jason J. Smart points out that since the, the uh, Russians are saying that they are at war with the West, then arming Ukraine won't cross any more red lines because we're already at war, according to Russia. It's even so bad that Russian propagandists are claiming that ISIS is not a serious organization, and therefore the Ukrainian defense intelligence people are far more competent and capable, and therefore it's them that did it, and they're the scariest you know, people in the world because they were the ones who actually arranged this whole thing, that they were the ones that, that did this operation, really, and arranged it to have these Tajik citizens actually uh, carry it out by paying them off. This is really upselling Ukraine's uh, abilities here. That's not to say that Ukraine isn't uh, doesn't have a vastly and capable intelligence organization. They have proved repeatedly that they are able to carry out um, operations well above their weight. But selling them as being able to carry out a terrorist attack like this with no real traces that lead back to them and ISIS actually taking credit for it themselves, that's a tall order. However, others, again, have, uh, this is one of the problems with this type of an, of, a, of an event. There's so much information out there. Some of it may be misinformation. Some of it may not be. Igor Susko says that maybe there could be a bit of a jumping of the gun attributing this solely to ISIS, but that it could have been, you know, this information could have been planted by Russia. And there was not enough human intelligence to coordinate that. In fact, there was a Russian military intelligence uh, officer who defected to Ukraine, who, is, uh, who states he is convinced or becoming increasingly convinced that this was a botched and poorly executed inside job by the Russian security services. Again, we've got people just kind of pulling information together, and I don't know exactly how much I can absolutely count on. So I want you to make sure you take some of this with a grain of salt here. The uh, Vladimir Osechkin also states that there were two obvious groups involved, the gunmen themselves and the, the he states the FSB who set the building on fire and caused it to collapse so fast. Of course, as they like to say, never let a crisis go to waste. So Serbia's president, Vucic, has stated that anybody who is anti-Putin over in their country are a threat to Serbian security, and the Serbian government will be merciless. They have new measure, security measures coming in soon. 
it's an excuse to crack down on Serbia. They've already had a lot of uprisings and, and a lot of things going on in their country. So the, the, uh, this guy is looking for more opportunities to crack down against protesters. And he may have found his, uh, his opportunity there. I'm going to take a brief pause and get a drink of water here. Uh, so bear with me while I get, uh, get things taken care of and I'll be right back. That was brief, so I apologize for that short delay. Uh, as Ozzy states, and I did see this in one of the sources, I don't have a good uh, confirming source on it at all, so I, I can't really speak to exact accuracy, but I did see that the attackers claimed during their confession that they were paid about $4,000 uh, for the mission, and they were supposed to get, I think it was half up front and half at the end. So overall, that's that just adds one more layer to the situation there. How in the world he thought, you know, I mean, you're right. If the Aussie, if they were basically a suicide mission, how did they expect to get paid for that in the end? All right, let's go ahead and move on to the news out of Ukraine itself. Uh, defense, sorry, not uh, defense, but... Um, National Security Council Secretary, there we go, Danilov, was dismissed from his position and was the replacement was Oleksandr Litvinenko. No reason was given for the dismissal, but this is probably just part of the leadership shakeup that kind of started earlier this year. Huge numbers of drone and missile attacks have been taking place over the last few days. This is uh, hitting the Ukraine's critical infrastructure even more than before. We already mentioned, I mentioned on a, uh, a post on YouTube that they had taken out the, uh, or at least heavily damaged the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant. And that is looking like it's going to take years to actually recover from. I think I got more on this. Let me quickly scan through things here and see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's going to take years to restore the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant after the attack. My understanding is that two of the power units are uh, damaged or even destroyed, and I don't believe the facility is producing power at all at this point in time. Ukraine's uh, security services said that they had foiled an attempted uh, sabotage attack by agents of the FSB at a railroad in Ukraine's Poltava Oblast. They do state that the individuals involved were actually Ukrainian citizens, which should indicate to you how much, how deep the uh, fingers and tentacles of Russia's FSB actually runs. Author Serhi Zadon has volunteered to enlist in the National Guard. As he said, it seems to me that today there are no writers or non-writers, musicians or non-musicians. There are citizens of Ukraine who feel responsible for their country. Quite the, uh, quite the, um, statement there, quite the, the willingness to volunteer it's been two years in, but you know what? Maybe it's time for them to start seeing uh, that it's going to take an all-out effort to win in the end. And people who'd maybe avoided service before, not so much deliberately, but so, so much as, you know, I'm not young, I'm not, you know, fit in that way. Some of them are starting to say, look, I've got to invest in my country and join up. So I'd say that people are starting to to really show their true colors, get into their get in there and support their country. This is a uh, part of the missile attack on Kiev. This is with the new hypersonic cruise missiles named Zircon. 
these are really fast and it takes just a short period of time for them to get to their targets. The f initial explosion hit and then the air raid siren sounded, which may indicate that Ukraine was caught off guard, maybe a little bit with their pants down. Kharkiv itself is out of power at the moment, although hang on a second. I think I saw something interesting here. Yes, hold on. Bring this forward a little bit. Whoops. This map shows kind of how long it takes for a Zircon cruise missile to be launched from effectively Sevastopol and impact a Ukrainian city. Three and a half minutes to Kiev, 5.3 minutes to Lviv, to the Dnieper, two and a half minutes, Venetia, 3.6, Kharkiv, 3.9, or Odessa in one minute. That means you'd have to be able to detect the missile sound the alarm in less than 60 seconds for Odessa. That's how much of a gun Odessa is under with these Zircon missiles here. They have to see them, they'd have to literally see them coming and only have 60 seconds notice. People can't get into their shelters in 60 seconds. Kharkiv has lost power for about 200,000 residents there. The Russians have been attacking energy infrastructure heavily in the Kharkiv region, leaving them in the dark. It's really been a struggle for them over there. As far as I understand, they're still without power in Kharkiv itself. Uh, I take it back. This actually specifies that Kharkiv is being supplied with power from other regions at this point in time. The analysis of the latest bombardments indicates that Ukraine, that Russia, I'm sorry, is going after Ukraine's energy infrastructure again. Ukraine's gotten really good at uh, at building and re repairing their energy infrastructure. Even so, there's going to be a breaking point involved there. The fact is that they managed to get through the heating season uh, to the through the worst of it of the heating season, as they call it. And this will make it so it's a lot lesser of an impact. But look at it from the other industries that could be involved. Ukraine's trying to build their own defense material. If they don't have reliable electricity, it's a lot harder to make uh, weapons and equipment. So they'll have to be watching out for that as well. Speaking of Kharkiv again, they have prematurely ended their heating season to reduce the load on the power grids. They state that Russia has virtually destroyed key energy facilities supplying the city. Apologies in advance for this one. I'm going to read exactly what he said, though. From Ukraine's foreign minister, Kuliba, he stated, Give us the damn patriots. After another round of these highly destructive attacks on energy infrastructure, on the hydroelectric power plant, they are running out of air defenses. They need more. Patriots can intercept many of these missiles, and they've done so successfully many times. If we had enough air defense systems, he says, namely Patriots, we would be able to not to protect not only the lives of our people, but also our economy from destruction. And in that same vein, after the latest round of missile strikes, several universities have re switched to entirely remote instructions for the next one to two weeks. Usually they were doing a kind of a mixed mode of instruction where they would kind of rotate class uh, uh, people in uh, at levels where they could actually keep it to fit with their bomb shelters. But this is now going to be entirely remote instruction. I think they're seeing some real challenges facing them in the near future. Let's go ahead and move on to the situation in Russia. Russia's announced the creation of two new armies. They do not have any real specification on how they're going to fill those two armies uh, with equipment and personnel. They, uh, they really, they didn't get into details on any of this. Uh, these... However, the defense intelligence of the UK does state that, that with the recruitment efforts that Russia has been able to pull off, that these units can be sufficiently staffed with the only question really being, will they be going straight into uh, 
straight into combat or not. In fact, that goes along the lines with the new 44th Army Corps in Luga, which they do mention that the question is going to be whether they get you know time away from the front lines or if they're going to be basically transferred to operations almost in immediately in Ukraine. Russia is no longer using the Crimean Bridge for weapons supplies after the multiple and repeated strikes. Ukraine's going to be watching that bridge closely. They've been using alternate routes uh, with either um, uh, transport vessels, you know, ships to move equipment and supplies through, or they've been using an overland route that's a little bit more uh, challenging to get through. Russia has been bombing Russia again uh, with two bombs found in the Belgorod region unexploded, one a Fab 50 near Smorododino and the other a Fab 250 near the village of Zabino. Ukraine has also been keeping pretty busy. They struck a fuel depot in Hvarsky in occupied Crimea. They have three tanks showing significant damage, which you can kind of see right in this area right here. This is just reducing the amount of supplies that Russia has, of fuel and other vital uh, material, and it'll be a, it'll have an eventual impact on Russia's ability to wage war. In that same vein, another refinery was struck just the other night, the Novokubyshevsk refinery in Samara. That's 900 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. Ukraine's getting really good at targeting these uh, uh, refineries precisely and capably. Pretty amazing technological skill with a remote drone pulling that off. Moving on to the international front, and it's uh, the front lines are going to be small, but don't worry, we've still got quite a bit more on the international front here. France has reported they aim to produce 100,000 complete 155 millimeter shells this year, with 80,000 of those going to Ukraine, with the rest going to the French military. They are There are reports that they should be able to up that to 150,000 shells eventually. Uh, overall, though, this is looking at the situation with the 155 millimeter shells. Uh, Europlasma is making just the shell bodies, not the complete shells. And they're going to deliver uh, 420,000 of those to Ukraine directly, who will do the filling and stuffing and, and all that type of stuff, putting the stuff inside them that is required. Kind of indicating the situation deteriorating in the world right now. The UK has announced the largest ever Royal Navy submarine as part of their continuous at sea deterrent. In other words, a nuclear missile carrier. Considering that not too long ago, Britain was basically kind of retired a lot of their nuclear capabilities. The fact that they're upgrading and moving forward should tell you exactly how serious the situation is getting in the world. Russia's begun sending oil to North Korea. This appears to be how they're paying for those arms that uh, North Korea has been sending to Russia in large quantity lately. So this is going to be in defiance of UN Security Council sanctions. And, uh, well, this is how the... This is how the dictators in the world are supporting each other. Russia's got the oil. They send it to North Korea. North Korea can then produce more weapons and equipment for Russia. Iran produces the drones. They send them to Russia. Russia provides intelligence and information and, uh, and of course, weapons testing to Iran. The bad guys of the world are uniting. They're getting working together. NATO is finally starting to look at the option for shooting down Russian missiles that get too close to NATO borders, according to the Polish deputy foreign minister. That was after a missile flew into Poland and was in their airspace for 39 seconds, and they just watched as it turned and went into Ukraine again. 
I'm, we're at the point now where we're going to where NATO is going to have to start taking an active role in stopping Russia from overflying NATO airspace, if nothing else, because that really shows a weakness on NATO's side. How much are they really going to put the effort into stopping Russia if they won't even shoot down a missile in NATO airspace? Iceland of all countries has joined the Czech initiative to provide artillery shells to Ukraine, committing 2 million euros to the, to the effort. This is enormous. I don't think Iceland even has a standing significant military, as I recall. Iceland military. Yeah. Iceland is a country without a military and is uh, basically working with NATO and other organizations to keep itself secure. Wow. I mean, come on. I think they've got a Coast Guard equivalent. Josip Borrell has confirmed that the EU will have delivered 500,000 shells to Ukraine by the end of March. This is part of their 1 million shells, of course, and they state that they'll have the rest of those shells in Ukraine by the end of the year. A little slow there, guys. We need to step up the pace. So speaking of the, the missile that went into Polish airspace, Poland finally summoned the Russian ambassador. They said, come over here and explain this to us. And the Russian ambassador just said, no, that's seriously, oh, that is bad diplomatic form. And Poland's going to have to get a serious response to that. Otherwise it's going to, this is going to be the pattern for the future. Maybe they expel all the Russian diplomats. I don't know. The Baltic countries and the Czech Republic have proposed to the EU to ban the import of ferrous metals, copper and aluminum scrap and waste from Russia. They sell them to the EU. Uh, they sell them to the EU and they use that money to support their war efforts. I mean, for one thing, they're making scrap in Ukraine. So it's not like there's any shortage of, Sorry, a shortage of scrap metal that Russia will have access to. They uh, are then using that that scrap metal, selling it to the EU, and then using that money to support their war effort. Uh, Ozzy says, "No army, only Coast Guard." Absolute yes, and it's uh, that's just indicates that they're they're watching what's going on, and they realize that their own future may be at risk if they don't support Ukraine in this. The French defense minister, Sebastian Lecornu, said said that he is prepared to use his powers to requisition industrial capacities or impose priorities to weapons makers to speed up production of arms and shells needed on the battlefield in Ukraine and elsewhere. I note he said he is prepared to use it. He did not invoke it. So that could be the shot across the bow for the military industrial complex over in France, stating that if they don't get their act together and really start cranking up production, they may not have an option in the matter in short order. 10 Ukrainian pilots have graduated from basic flight school in the RAF, which prepared them for fast attack, fast jet training and conversion to F-16. So these pilots will be able to move on to uh, training with the Air Force Capability Coalition to become F-16 pilots. This is talking more about the uh, the missile over Poland. I'm going to just go ahead and let that one slip for now, just because we've discussed that one. Josip Borrell also stated about this situation in Ukraine and about your, the European Union and NATO's support for Ukraine. It's not a matter of generosity alone. It's not a matter of support for Ukraine because we love the Ukrainian people. It is in our own interests and is, it is also in the interests of the U S as a global player, the one who has to be perceived as a reliable partner and a security provider to the allies. This is why we call on the U S to open and approve the supplementary budget. The U S is standing as basically the guarantor of the, of peace in the world. And of course, being a reliable partner is truly in jeopardy. 
And if nations realize that the U.S. is not a reliable partner, we will start getting cut out of the alliances and the benefits that are associated. Some people will say, great, that means that we're not involved in those things anymore. They won't like the world when all of a sudden China decides they're going to embargo U.S. Uh, the U.S., that they're not going to send any of their products here, or the uh, or Russia will decide they're not going to export oil to any uh, U.S. anybody who buys with the U.S. in mind. A uh, on not having allies results in a world where the U.S. becomes a lot more vulnerable. And I'm bringing this one in because, I, uh, much like I mentioned earlier, the dictators of the world are getting together, and they're doing their things, and they're supporting each other. In the South China Sea, there's been another deterioration in relations between China and the Philippines, with a clash between Coast Guard ships from both countries sparking a diplomatic row involving other actors in the region. Now, what happened is, and I saw a video of this, the, there were two, um, uh, there was a Chinese vessel, a Chinese warship, and a Philippine Coast Guard vessel. Um, the Chinese warship was approaching a Philippine island. The Philippine vessel was just doing a regular resupply run for that island. And the Chinese ship used a water cannon against the, uh, against the, um, the Philippines Coast Guard ship which was not prepared as a warship. It's a Coast Guard vessel. The water cannon shattered the windows of their, of their bridge, literally destroying most of the bridge and injuring many of the personnel in that area. That's, that's literally lethal force being used, even though it is a water cannon. That's how much the escalations are happening over in the Philippine Sea. More of these dictators are being quite happy that the U.S. is not really taking the leadership role, that they're not actually stepping forward to protect their allies. Aussie states. Like all Nordic nations, Iceland understands Russia. Iceland almost collapsed a few years back due to Russian funded financial shenanigans and buying a high level Icelandic politician. Seems like Russia's been really good at buying politicians these days. And that just seems to be a an ongoing theme, I think, is the word I would like to use. Also, they've been kind of doing the same kind of financial shenanigans that China has been doing, just not at the same level. So... They, it's where they loan a country some things to build some infrastructure and they give them terms that really don't work out for that nation and try and then seize the assets back and take over some of that area it really causes a lot of havoc and problems for the finances of those countries. So thank you, Ozzy. You are, uh, as always, you are a valued insight into the things going on in the world. Let's move on to the front lines. Now, I'm going to tell you straight up, the front line has been clarified as the, all the updates for the last couple of days. There was some advancement in Nova Mihalivka just the other day by the Russians as overall. Uh, but overall, in general, the situation has remained relatively static with a few changes, such as this uh, change near Terni and Kermina axis. That would be... Right over here on the map. Yep, you can see that. I'll zoom in there. Turney's right here at the end of this. And Russia's been making gradual jumps in this area over the last while. They did a lot of them last fall, uh, then were driven back pretty neatly by Ukrainian forces at the time. Well, now they've apparently captured this additional chunk about... Uh, they're about one and a half kilometers from turning at this point, and it looks like they're trying to push for the this water feature here. As Ukraine control map states, things are getting very dicey at Turney. If Turney and Yampol Yampolivka go, Torska and Zarichne are next and could cause the loss of the entire Kramina forest area. 
The War Gonzo, this is from the Russian Perspective Report, kind of confirms some of the information. That kind of does also clarify that some of the, there's a lot of fighting going on. For instance, over near Verbova, there's been a lot of uh, fighting in that area. He states that neither side has shown a real advantage. But the fact is, it's Russia trying to push their way into uh, uh, Robotna, and they're not making any progress. So the advantage remains, at least for this point in time, with Ukraine in that area. They do mention the advance towards Nova Mihailovka and state that they have captured, the Russians have captured the eastern part of the village, and they're still advancing towards the village from the south. And that's the front lines as they stand. There's not a whole lot more to it right now. I understand that doesn't mean people are, are not fighting and dying. They are. It's just that the actual exchanges of territory at this point are remaining pretty small, even smaller than when Ukraine was on a full offensive. Let's move on to some interesting extras. This piece of unidentified ammunition was extracted from the leg of a wounded Ukrainian defender. That thing's enormous. Looks like it's, uh, what, maybe two inches across? And it's got a, a threaded base here. I don't, I don't recognize it. I don't know what it is. Uh, just, just a weird thing that got pulled out of this guy's leg. Thankfully, uh, they managed to save the leg. Other news, not really related to the Ukraine war, but vitally interesting to U.S. citizens at this point in time. A three-kilometer-long road bridge called the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed when an out of an unpowered large cargo ship uh, ended up uh, drifting into the center support section. It collapsed the entire bridge across. There was a, a distress signal sent out by the ship itself indicating they had lost power and there were other issues. There were cars still on the bridge, but the distress signal did allow them to close the bulk of the bridge and other vehicles were not allowed on. There were some workers on the bridge and I believe it's seven vehicles, sorry, seven, it says seven people here, but I thought it was about seven vehicles in total ended up in the water. The vessel remains pinned as well underneath the remains of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. This is a Dolly container vessel. Really just, it's it's bad news because this is the port of Baltimore. This is the 13th most important U.S. port for foreign trade. That's a huge economic impact on the city, but more than that, it's also a huge economic impact on the country. Yes, it's not the largest one out there, but the fact is that every port that we that is taken out of service will have to be routed around, causing additional uh, knock-on effects in supply chains, logistics, and other issues. I'm not going to talk about this one extensively. The Lev Parnas is the man who was basically um, Donald Trump's front man on the situation in Ukraine when he was in, the, in office at the time. He's the one that was sent to Ukraine to kind of pressure them into doing things on behalf of Donald Trump. And he gave his, uh, his insights to the, to the investigative committees in, the, uh, in Congress. However, he also did a brief interview with J journalist Jason J. Smart, which I found to be an interesting listen. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Understand it does result in some partisan uh, material that's uh, anti-Trump. So if you are, are pro-Trump and don't want to have your mind changed, uh, then you don't want to watch this video. That said, I'm just providing it because it is related to Ukraine and it explains why Donald Trump would just as soon Ukraine was taken by Russia. In that same vein, the Kiev Post has also provided a uh, some interviews of people in Paris, France, and uh, I thought that they were very interesting. They're brief, and it shows that there is an interesting mix of perspectives on whether they would should provide uh, French troops to uh, to um, to support Ukraine. They also continued on to London, and I believe one more uh, capital, as I recall. 
Uh, but the, um, but either way, it's, uh, it's, it was interesting to see the perspectives that people have and it's varied. It's not, it's not just, uh, it's not all supportive. It's not all against. So keep that in mind. It's a very good watch. And we'll end off with this young lady in a coffee shop here. And you can watch as just about in a few seconds here, an explosion from a, a Russian missile attack takes out the window, shatters in, uh, onto the, uh, the customers and her, leaving the place in shambles. But here she is just a few minutes later, still serving up coffee with a broken window still over her shoulder and saying, they won't break us. This is the resilience that Ukraine is exhibiting. The closest thing I ever saw was after Hurricane Katrina. And my employer at the time sent me down to assist customers in getting back online. And I drove around uh, Baton Rouge and, uh, and New Orleans and uh, the and areas in that area that were the some of the most impacted areas of the storm just a few weeks after when the worst of it had been already um, dealt with. And I remember one time I was in a I went to an Applebee's in uh, just across the to the next state over, and they were open. The carpet had been ripped out of the building. The chairs were whatever they could recover. And they were open with whatever they could get. They didn't have their normal suppliers. So they were cooking food for anybody would, who wanted it. You'd have, you're still buying it, of course. But you'd get a can of soda instead of a glass. You The menu was extremely limited. They You might get, be able to get a burger or a piece of chicken, but you wouldn't be able to get any of the, their better dishes, like no steak that day, for instance. Um, and so they were just, they were making do with anything they could put together. I went into a grocery store where they had robbed some of the equipment I was supposed to repair. So they'd have power to run some of their other systems so they could actually get back and open and operational. And they would open up with a couple of loaves of bread on the shelves and they would sell until the bread was gone. And then they'd close the store and then they'd get whatever they could get in the next truck or whatever they could pull in. These people invested everything in trying to to get their their own homes back together to get their to get their state back together to overcome the challenges of mother nature and that's that's the type of spirit i'm seeing in ukraine these people are going the step farther this is even more than than just trying to recover from a disaster but it's trying to recover from an attack by an enemy an attack on their way of life, on their way of even existing. And they are um, saying to themselves that the Russians won't win. Our spirit is too strong. As, the, as we've heard it said before, if we change our way of life for this, then the enemy has won. And these people are just going to keep going because they are that strong and powerful and they know what's at, what's at stake for them. They may not consider that they are, that they are um, effectively fighting for the Western world. That may not even be part of their consideration, but that should be because they are. They're trying to face up to the dictator, the bully. And the more of this resilience that they can have, this like this uh, Maria here who kept serving coffee, even with the shattered window over her shoulder, even just moments after the missile struck and helping out people and moving forward and living despite the, the challenge. That's the spirit they're going to need. And that's the spirit we need in the West. No more can we hide behind our behind our Western world and, and and say, well, we're at peace. We've been at peace for so long. It's time to to ride to step forward. 
And these Ukrainians are. And that's everything for today. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad you were here. I appreciate all of your comments. Ozzy, especially appreciate yours, your background. Yes, your four decades of geopolitical geekery are working out for you very, very well. I've been more invested in, in, in U.S. politics overall. And to a certain extent, this exploration of the war in Ukraine has helped to open my eyes on the interconnectedness of our world and shown me, not that I ever kind of doubted it, but might have maybe put it more into perspective that the the people who desire freedom, the Western world, uh, need to be a part of it, need to be uh, need to stand up to those who are who are wanting to tear it down, who are wanting to to return to an era of dictatorships and and evil. And this has been a real eye-opener for me, too. I appreciate y'all being here again. You have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you on the next video.